two men around the same age, same physical condition. One of us suffered so much that he took his own life and the other didn't suffer at all. And the only difference between the two of us was that one of us had trained their mind. Mm. There is your example. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. How you are in it is dependent on your mind. And so learning to tame and train your mind is truly the most powerful thing you can do. Welcome to Mind the Shift. At last, we have a new episode after a month-long hiatus, well, apart from a couple of uh, video logs that I've posted. My name is Anders Bolling. Uh, today, we're going to talk about happiness. Doesn't that sound wonderful? And I am happy and excited to introduce you to Monique Rhodes. Welcome to the show, Monique, and good morning. Uh, good morning, Anders. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. So you're in New Zealand right now. Are you in Auckland or Wellington or what's even the- better? You know where the Lord of the Christ Rings Church? was filmed, right down in the bottom in Queenstown. Oh, yes, that's where I am. Looking right now, I'm looking out onto the the beautiful mountains, and uh, I mean, it, it's very quintessential. The one of the most stunning parts of New Zealand. So I'm very, very lucky to be here. Yes, I would very much love to go there. I haven't been to that other end of the, I mean, it's 12 hours from here, but so it's exactly at the nothing. other end of the, of the no, it's, it's nothing. It's really nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. So I'll go there one day. So anyway, um, I think you're my first Kiwi guest, by the way, I've had a couple of Aussies. You probably wouldn't, don't want to hear that, but uh, I have. <laughs> we love the Aussies. As long yeah. as we're beating them in cricket and rugby, we're happy. True. True. So you're a happiness specialist and that, really uh, seems like a, a dream job. And we'll get back to to the present day, Monique, shortly. I will just um, briefly try to, to introduce you to the, to the audience, to the listeners and viewers here by, by uh, uh, telling about what you have been doing. As Hopefully I, I get it right. You will, you're invited to correct me if I get anything wrong here. But before you started doing what you do today, you led a very uh, interesting, diverse, colorful life. Some might call it wild, perhaps. Uh, for 13 years, you didn't have a steady home. You traveled the world and everything you owned would fit in a bag. Uh, you bought um, a motorcycle and crisscrossed India from the Himalayas down to the southern tip. You lived in slums and later you lived in a castle in Switzerland. And you are an accomplished singer songwriter also. And you have been the opening act on two of Chuck Berry's European tours. But as far as I understand, if we go even further back, you were once a pretty depressed teenager. And when traveling in the Himalayas, you began developing what is now a successful mindfulness meditation program, the 10-Minute Mind, which is currently used at 30 universities and colleges, colleges around the world. And you have launched a number of other courses for mental and, and spiritual self-healing. One is called the Happiness Baseline. You have cooperated with known spiritual teachers and leaders like Eckhart Tolle, Teach Nat Han. I hope I pronounced that right. Ignatan, and the, yeah, yeah, and the Dalai Lama, and and one can get a daily dose of of your wisdom and of inspiration from your bite-sized podcast in your right mind. Pretty impressive, isn't it? I mean, when you hear it like this. <laughs> I get. I guess when you lay it out like that, it sounds as though I've done. I've done okay. Yeah, you have done okay. But Monique, would it be fair to say that there there is a straight line from that depressed teenager via your, I mean, life embracing adventures to the the f- focused work on happiness that you do today? Um, it, it's not a straight line at all, but it is definitely a line. So. It was, you know, I think that a lot of young people, I think even more so today, are suffering. 
I think that learning how to deal with your thoughts and emotions is is really, really difficult. And growing up in a difficult environment, you know, made it very, very hard for me to be able to almost ground myself properly. So I was, you know, very, very depressed by the time I hit my late teens and ended up trying to take my own life. And I kind of asked myself the question at that time, as I sat in a hospital bed, why is it that some people are happy? And why is it that some people like me are struggling so much? And is it just something that I kind of have to deal with in my life? Or is it something that I can change? So I decided to go on a mission to see whether these happiness levels were movable or not, and to see whether I could find some solutions to shifting them. And so that's where all the adventures came from, like, you know, go, traveling all over the world, trying to understand it, trying to figure it out, looking at different philosophies. And as you can probably see, you know, just from the way I show up, completely transforming my life. Um, and it made me see that it was all possible. And then sort of by accident, I've ended up starting this business, teaching other people how to do it, that now, yeah, we we have thousands and thousands of students all over the world that I work with. And I, you're right, Anders, it is a dream job, helping people to be happier, teaching people how to work with themselves and their minds, um, and teaching them things that I wish we were taught when we were younger is, I don't, I don't yeah, know what could be cool. more rewarding. Yeah, imagine it. Imagine if we were taught these skills at school. It would be revolutionary. I don't think we would have the problems that we do today. Imagine if everyone in the world was taught these skills. I don't think we would have the wars that we have. I think people would take care of each other really differently because they would understand that their happiness wasn't based on accumulating things for themselves. You said you started this business by, by accident. What do you mean by that? I was in the south of India. I was actually doing a music project for the Dalai Lama down there. And these two girls came to me one day and they said, hey, we know that you sit on that rooftop every morning meditating. Will you teach us how to meditate? And I said, absolutely not. I'm not teaching you how to meditate. Like I had no idea how to do it. And they came back the next day and I said no. And on the third day when they came back, I started to feel a little bit embarrassed and I thought, it, this might actually be a bad thing that this is the third time they've come back and asked me. So I agreed to it. I said, come to my rooftop at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. They came up. I taught what I'm sure was the worst meditation lesson ever to be taught. <laughs> and the next day they showed up with their two friends. And I was like, what are you doing here? And they said, oh, we told our friends about your class and they wanted to come. And I was like, oh, my goodness, that is just not really what I'm wanting. So instead of teaching meditation, what I did was I taught them why I had done it, why it was so important to me. And before I knew it, there were 50 people on my rooftop every morning at eight o'clock that I was teaching. And I just fell in love with teaching people how to meditate. And so that's actually how it started. Funny, Fantastic. right? I love that. I love that story. <laughs> I mean, that's the way everything, every endeavor should should begin, actually. Yeah. From, so I mean, I, it, starting from the heart, actually. Yeah, heart. definitely. And and starting from a place where you, I don't know, you kind of discover that you love it without without realizing it was something that you would be good at doing. I didn't. I had no idea that I was uh, would even enjoy teaching something, mm -mm. and I completely love it. Is the problem with our stressed society today, I, I would say globally, but mainly perhaps in the Western world, I guess the Western world more or less comprises the whole world today. Is it that we live too much in our minds or too little in our minds, or do we perhaps use our minds in the wrong way? That's a great question. Do we live too much, too little, or do we use our mind in the wrong way? On a lot of levels, I think that we live in our mind too much. We live on that logical kind of strategic problem-solving level too much. And I think that we don't understand the connection between the mind and the heart. So we live in, in that place without connecting it into our heart. 
I think that we don't know how to manage our mind. I think our minds are out of control. There's lots of reasons for that. And I think that it's really understandable that our minds are out of control. But if we were to learn how to tame and train our mind, I think it would completely change so much for us because if we continue the way that we're going, the mental health crisis that we're facing is only going to get worse and worse. You know, the World Health Organization said some years ago that in 2030, the biggest health problem worldwide would be depression. That was pre-pandemic. Mm. I can only imagine that stress, anxiety, and depression are the biggest health problem now surpassing obesity already. I would be very surprised if they weren't because we're really facing a massive mental health crisis. So for me, the one thing I'm constantly teaching my students is the most important thing that you can do is start to learn to build a relationship with your mind, get to know your mind, learn how to work with it so that you turn it from being your worst enemy and really into your best friend. And that is completely possible. Yeah, I I think that we're not really here most of the time. Don't, don't you think also? I mean... Yeah, we're, we're like we're here, but we're not here. We're somewhere else in our minds. We're thinking about the future or the past. Well, you've been cooperating with Eckhart Tolle, I understand. So uh, everybody who has read his book, The Power of Now, knows knows this concept of being in the now moment. But it's it's very easy to say, and it's it's pretty difficult to to do actually in our modern world because we have so many tasks in our head that we think we we need to do and. Uh, think about all the time so is that a trick really to to be present is it a trick i think it's a lifestyle and is and i think that if you're wanting to be more in the present moment it's important to look at it in in your whole lifestyle so for me that's something that i i look at consistently and constantly constantly. And I think one of the things that it's vital for us to understand why dancing off into the past and dancing off into the future is so problematic is because we're dancing into places in our mind that don't actually truly exist. Mm -hmm. So the past is finished. It doesn't exist anymore. It's just a figment of our imagination and it's very subjective. The future hasn't come yet. That doesn't exist either. So the only moment that's actually real is now. But what we're doing most of the time is living in these two other states that aren't real. And when we do, it causes a lot of stress and anxiety because our mind is having to work in kind of overdrive, taking pieces of this imaginary past, bringing them into the present moment, taking pieces of this imaginary future, bringing them into the present moment and constantly ruminating in our mind. If we can learn how to be in the present moment, then our stress and our anxiety immediately start to lessen because we're only dealing with one particular state, the only place that's real, which is now. So if we look at that, we then have to look at what are all the things that take us away from the present moment? Well, we live in a time now since the iPhone and really since the advent of the internet, where we have all of these devices that are designed to distract us. So for me, it's really important to look at my environment. You know, how many notifications are happening? Uh, what, are, what do I have on my phone? What do I not have on my phone? Um, when I'm, you know, like I have whole bunch, a whole bunch of things set up where I'm constantly monitoring what I'm doing. You know, I have reader view on my phone, so I can't be inundated with advertising and messaging. And, you know, I'm very careful about not having my phone or devices near my bedroom, you know, so that you have device free kind of areas. But also one of the big things I do, Anders, is I read a lot because I also think that we have a Uh, a propensity to not be able to hold our focus for very long on specific things. So reading can be a really good antidote to that. It can keep us focused on something for a longer period of time. And just to understand that we can't multitask. It's not actually possible. It's not possible for us to multitask. The moment we go from one task to the next, it takes 15 minutes for our mind to adjust to the new task. So we have to be realistic. Even though everybody else is 
you know, doing this stuff with their habitual way of being, it doesn't mean that it's the wisest thing to do just because the majority of people are saying it. So, um, yeah, I think that it's, it's really important for us to get our head around the fact that we have to do things differently from other people if we want a different result. And if you want to be well in your mind, then you have to look at what people are doing now and think, I might have to adjust a few things because if if the World Health Organization is right, then collectively we're making some big mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't, I, I actually said, is it the trick, not a trick, but anyway. Uh, so No, I'm, I understand that. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, because I understand that the, the, we really have to be in the in the now moment much more than than we are and actually it's 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 like kind of like living in a dream when we're not in the now, now moment and and sometimes occasionally we we kind of wake up uh, i mean we all experience this it's like we're, we're we're somewhere else we're just walking around like zombies I, I i think it's fascinating to to see how reality seems to change from Let's say from threatening to joyful, it could be the other way around, of course, but let's say from threatening to joyful, just when we have, for instance, when we haven't slept well and then sleep in and or when we've been sick and then suddenly become well and or when something bad that we anticipated didn't happen. It it's kind of just changes. We all know what this feeling is. But if we look at our, I mean, if we just stop and examine the actual situation that we're in, our actual reality it's been the same all along. Nothing has changed, right? I mean, it's exactly the same. It's just in our heads, in our minds that this reality has been shifting. It, it's fascinating and it's, it's crazy anyway. Mm. So, um, Monique, what are the best uh, practical tools, would you say, to increase one's happiness? I think that one of the most important things to understand uh, from my perspective is that happiness is actually a habit. And I think that we underestimate the habitual places that our minds go to. So that's really vital for us to understand. So I think I want to explain that to you a little bit. Please so it's like this. It's like this. So there are eight levels of consciousness. I'm trying to find something that I can show you to give you an example. Great. There's eight levels of consciousness, right? The first five levels are our senses. So if I was to show you this, this simple highlighter, what happens is the first thing is that your uh, one of your five senses, which of course is your sight, sees this. Then your sixth consciousness kicks in and uh, recognizes it, recognizes a highlighter. Now we get into the problematic stuff. Your seventh consciousness then decides, I like it, I don't like it, or I feel neutral about it. And then your eighth consciousness is like your memory bank consciousness, and it stores your reaction to this highlighter in it. And from then on, you start reacting to what you're experiencing in your environment based on the eighth consciousness, which is storing all these memories. So let's get, let me give you an example. Let's say you look at this highlighter and you go, oh, I really like that highlighter. If you look deeply, you might think, gosh, when I was a kid, I had highlighters like that and it was really fun at school and I've got such a good memory of it. Equally, you might look at it and go, when I was at school, my teacher was so mean to me. She had a highlighter like that. And so your, your um, reaction to this highlighter isn't based on the present moment. It's based on your experiences in the past. Mm. And just think about it like this. You walk into a restaurant and uh, the waiter comes up and it's a guy called Sean and you take a look at Sean and he reminds you of a guy that you knew when you were younger and you your wall is down. You immediately feel a warmth towards him. It is not at all based on who this guy is. It's based on a past memory. Equally, you might look at him and he might remind you of someone you didn't like. So you your wall goes up. This is how we're relating all of the time. Okay. We're relating 
based on past memories. So that movement from the sixth consciousness that recognizes this is a highlighter to I like it, I don't like it, or I'm neutral to it happens for most people as quickly as, you know, when you have your iPhone or your phone on and uh, it uh, you have it, go, it goes directly to voicemail, you know, it doesn't even ring. That's mm. how quickly it happens. This happens in an instant. And this is where meditation practice is so powerful because it, what it does is it slows down the movement from the sixth consciousness to the seventh, but it also starts to drain the eighth consciousness, okay? So you start to begin to learn to be a lot more in the present moment. You start to see that instead of going quickly into a reaction, this gap begins to, to show itself. And the more and more you have a meditation practice, the bigger you'll see this gap is happening. And what that gap does is it helps us to realize that in any moment, we have a choice in how we react to things. We don't have to do it automatically. And the meditation practice also starts to drain this memory bank of experience so that we start to move into our lives where we're actually relating a lot more consciously rather than habitually. But equally, what we can then see is if we set up habits for ourselves that are really powerful, habits where we're using our mind in a powerful way, that those habits can also be really positive for us to increase our happiness. So these two things in conjunction with each other, I think, are really, really powerful for us to understand. So the habit is uh, ha the habit of being happy. Is that a side effect of the habit of of uh trying to, to, as you say, neutralize the, the eighth and the seventh. Uh, yeah, I think, it, I think the big thing is that we're pretty much habitual. So if you want to, you can um, help yourself with the negative automatic habits by working with those levels of consciousness. But equally, you can set yourself up so that if you're someone like me, I'm habitually courageous. I'm habitually positive. I'm habitually grateful. I habitually see the goodness in people because I've built a series of habits around this that mean that my automatic response is to be loving and kind in as many situations as I possibly can. Do you think we miss a lot of opportunities when we're being so prejudgmental all the time that we can see the thing? We, 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 like you said, <laughs> if you... We pick up a marker, then we get uh, memories from from uh, some kind of bad school memories from childhood or whatever. So we, we yeah, well, we. I mean, we endlessly. The, the pen, but if, if we meet a person who who we who reminds us of some some bad encounter in the past, then we might miss a lot of opportunities. I mean, that that person might be a, a fantastic person to to get to know, who can help you with a lot of things. And uh, do you think we miss miss a lot? I think the opportunity that we miss, Anders, is the opportunity to be a loving person. So whether that person shows up as a wonderful person that you might enjoy or someone that's difficult, in both situations, you have the opportunity to show up as a loving person. And if your natural reaction is to be defensive and self-protective out of habit, then what you do is you miss the opportunity to either be really loving to a person that you might really enjoy and also to be really loving to a person who may teach you something because anyone that we come up against who's difficult has the opportunity to show us places in ourselves that we're lacking in love. So that's that's the opportunity that I would believe that we miss out on. How would you define happiness and where, where does it come from? Where From where does it arise in, in us? I think that there's two types of happiness. One is a sensorial happiness. So uh, right now you and I are doing this podcast and it's really fun and enjoyable. And I have this feeling of wellness and my energy levels are higher. But after we stop doing this podcast, that feeling will naturally dissolve. So that's not long lasting. That's a sensorial level of happiness. But there's a fundamental happiness that we can have that increases uh, over time and also is long lasting. And I really see that as a place where no matter what is happening in our lives, we still feel grounded and well. So it's a little bit like if you think about it with the ocean, most of the time, 
imagine you're learning to surf and you're being pummeled by the waves and you're being thrown around. That's how most of us are living. Whereas I think happiness is where you're actually on the surfboard, on top of the waves, all of the thoughts and the emotions of the waves, they're all happening and you're just able to handle them, manage them and kind of not attach yourself to them and just sit on top of them. And that to me is, is what I think happiness is. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good definition, I think. Uh, and and I, I think personally, I don't know what you would say about that, but pe- people misunderstand happiness or they, they think that it's, it has to do with joy or uh, euphoria or something like that. But I think that's wrong. I mean, should we really strive for, for that kind of happiness? Or is it like, because I mean, life is so rich in experiences, emotions and experiences that we have that we can learn from. So isn't it even, be- even better to learn to embrace, say, sadness, boredom, even anger sometimes? Um, and, and as a byproduct of that, we might actually get better at feeling what you might call blissfully neutral, if you see my point. I think that there are, you know, there's always the light and shadow with everything and is. And I think that life is glorious and incredibly wretched in a lot of ways. And if we're able to see that the the glorious nature of life really makes us feel good, it gives us energy, it motivates us, it's wonderful. I can look out the window right now, everything just looks glorious. And I have that, you know, really wonderful feeling of well being. But if I sat in that feeling all the time, the risk would be an arrogance could kind of seep in. So the wretchedness then becomes equally as powerful because the wretchedness creates a humility. The difficulties in life enable me to connect with other people, to understand their vulnerability through understanding my own vulnerability, to understand their pain and suffering through understanding my own. And if I, if there weren't both sides, like you can't see the light without the darkness. And I think it's really important for us to understand that both sides exist in everything. What we have a tendency to do is when negative things arise, we're unable to actually see the light that sits in there as well. When positive things arise, we fear the shadow side of it. So I'm always trying to look at both sides. Whenever something comes up, I I try to look at both sides equally and have that as a practice. Doesn't mean that I get down. It just means that I that I know that everything exists as a whole. And when you sit in that place and you don't get too attached to, oh, this is so negative or oh, this is so joyful, and you just allow it all just to be, then you can stay in a pretty happy place most of your life. Um, Almost like, you know, when you, you know, that saying, I don't know if you know it, and is but water off a duck's back, you know, it's almost like you want things just to want to see them, you want to experience them, and just allow them to roll off your back, like water rolls off the back of a duck. It's so powerful, so that you don't become attached to positive experiences and you don't reject negative experiences. But I think that we have to understand that they all exist. That's very true. What is your opinion about following the news, the media? Uh, does, is, does doing that block the road to happiness? Oh, it's such a hard question because, you know, there's an importance in being able to stand up against what is injustice. Um, So it's important for us to have understanding, not to be oblivious. However, at the same time, the amount of uh, information that we're fed that is driven by uh, media companies making a whole lot of money is not beneficial for us. So I think that everyone has to find their own way. For me, I take like uh, I set an alarm 10 minutes in the morning. I know I sound super disciplined, but I'm kind of wild. So, but there are things I have boundaries around to keep myself well. I just set an alarm 10 minutes. I look through a series of different news sites to see what are the main things of the day so I can get an idea. I know what's happening. I know what's going on, Mm -hmm. but I don't indulge in it. 
so I don't go down the rabbit hole. And I I see with my students, particularly if they're really struggling with stress, anxiety, and depression, if one of the first things that we do is look at their intake of news, and as I swear to you, they're they're in the United States, they've got their TV on, the news is oh, rolling, yeah, yeah, yeah. their energy levels are becoming more and more stressed. So I think it's important to understand. It's good to have a level of information, how much level of information that you need in your life is up to you, but to also understand that the news cycles are there for people to make money. You know, they're not there anymore to inform you. They're really there for people to make money. So you have to be very thoughtful about that as you consume it. Mm. Wise advice. Yeah, I, I've cut down on my news consumption quite significantly. I've, I've been working as a journalist for 25 years or something like that but uh, i'm not doing that anymore but at least not as a news journalist i'm kind of a journalist i guess still but uh, i think that for me it's it suffices to read to read snippets of news at more or less like like you say you do i don't want to watch it on tv that much i mean it happens but not every day because it's very emotional when you see it on tv if you read some snippets you get a you get a general view of what's what's going on, as you say, and then you can you, you can just yeah, go about your day. Yeah. So um, yeah, and today I mean we we're in a constant uh, state of crisis it seems, but that that is also in my opinion that is also kind of a, a narrative that we are being fed with from the mainstream mainstream not just the mainstream media but also from the leaders and organizations and all that so you have to be careful when you when you watch uh, when you take that in because um, you, I, I think you're well advised to check the facts and the trends and the averages yourself and go to that kind of websites and not only news websites so you can, you can make your own judgment about what what is actually happening but anyway we know that there are <laughs> some real crises happening which there have always been we have for instance today a shocking war situation in in Europe, and uh, most of us probably never thought that was was going to happen again. But it but it did. So um, I think that's many. Going back to the happiness thing here, many people seem to have a bad conscience about being happy or joyful when there is suffering in the world. Just the other day, a friend posted pictures um, from a wonderful walk on a beautiful beach. And she basically apologized for doing such a thing when Ukraine was being invaded. Do we help people, you think, people affected by war or, or something like that, by feeling miserable ourselves? I don't think at all it's helpful. I think that, you know, if, if we have the freedom and the ability to be in a war-free zone, that we should cherish and honor that, to also understand that, it's only our good fortune and good luck, but but that the more positive energy going into the world, the better it is for us. I think the question is more, and is is when we look at these wars, for us to ask ourselves the question more closely of um, we we often can look at a war situation and make judgments. This the, these person, these people, this is terrible. But I think the most powerful thing we can do is look into our own hearts and ask ourselves the question, where is it in my life that I create war? Is it with my husband, my wife, my partner, my children, my co-workers? Where is it that I create dissension without realizing it? Do I speak unkindly about someone? Do I go to the supermarket and maybe be a little bit, you know, irritated with the person behind the counter? So I think that it's really vital for us to take a situation where we can see right now that there is one person driving a crisis in our whole world and understand that it's really possible for one person to make a difference. So if that one person can create so much negativity in our world, it's vital for us to understand that it's even more important for us to take responsibility for our own feelings for how we are, how we're showing up in the world, and also even more so how we're showing up with this idea of us and them, the other, that I think is a really big problem. Mm. So what we can do instead of apologizing for being happy and walking in a beautiful place, 
instead to actually take some deep responsibility on a personal level for ourselves because We can't affect the war that is happening in the world right now, but we can affect what is happening in our circle of influence, in our own world. And I think it's important that we don't underestimate that. So instead of looking at war as being something that's happening outside of ourselves, to really look at the wars that happen inside of ourselves, in our own in our own lives, in our own communities, and the and the way that we contribute to that. And then we can make a much, much bigger difference rather than apologizing for walking yeah. somewhere beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Be the change that you want to see in the world, more or less. Yeah. So what do you, as I said, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that, that the world is in a complete crisis situation, but at least things are happening very much more fast and and swiftly these days than, than they used to be. So it's very confusing. So what do you make of this? at least seeming messiness in the world. Is humanity shifting, you think? I don't know. I think that it's, I think that with the internet, the age of the internet, we have so much information that we never would have had. You know, in the past, all sorts of things would have been going on that no one would have any awareness of. Yeah. So I think that that is a, a really difficult thing. I think that for as long as human beings have been upright, they've been causing problems with each other. Uh, you know, power is really problematic. And I think that the world definitely is changing where there are bigger conversations. There are really important conversations happening, but I'm not sure that we're going into a kind of I'm I'm not sure that as human beings we're becoming any worse than we ever were to be honest. I think we have a massive crisis. It's called the climate crisis that we seem to be hurtling towards with oblivion. So again it comes back to look you can't do anything about these big things. Even the climate crisis should be dealt with by, you know, governments on a governmental level that's not happening. So all you can do is be responsible for yourself, you know, and to bring it back again and again to yourself. That's the most powerful thing you can do to stop blaming everybody else for what's happening and to start to take responsibility for you. Your reality, your happiness actually lies in your hands doesn't rely on whether there's a war. It doesn't rely on whether there's a COVID crisis. It's all about how you're responding and reacting and how you're responding and reacting is due to the habitual habits of your mind. How do you deal with that? You learn to tame and train your mind. How do you do that? You do that by starting to become very, very conscious of yourself. One of the most powerful ways you can do that is by beginning a meditation practice, some kind of meditation practice, whether it's Even, you know, just spending time by yourself, nurturing yourself, like whatever, but get to know you, get to know your mind, get to see where your mind goes on an habitual level, start to take responsibility for yourself. Then your whole world will change. So, you know, there are, there's a great story I want to tell you, Anders, that will give you an example of why this is so important. Many years ago, I met a wonderful Tibetan Buddhist Lama called Gachin Rinpoche. And Gachin Rinpoche, when uh, China invaded Tibet, he was put into a Chinese prison camp. He was in there for 21 years. And when he came out, he told me this story about how when he first went into the camp, he was in there with another man. They were in the same cell together. And it was very, very difficult conditions. And he said, this guy became his best friend. And he said, my friend really, really struggled with the conditions in the camp. One day, he said, they slept on a mat together on the floor. He said, one day I woke up and there was blood on me and my friend had found something to slit his own throat and he took his own life. And he said something then that has had the most profound effect on me. He said, here we were in the same cell, in the same conditions, two men around the same age, same physical condition. One of us suffered so much that he took his own life and the other didn't suffer at all. And the only difference between the two of us was that one of us had trained their mind. Mm. 
there is your example. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. How you are in it is dependent on your mind. And so learning to tame and train your mind is truly the most powerful thing you can do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very powerful story. Um, I, I came to think of Nelson Mandela also, who sat in prison for 27 years and, and uh, the apart, apartheid regime couldn't, I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't get um, at his uh, mind, at his soul. They could, on, they could imprison him, but they couldn't really, I mean, so that's, that's very powerful. Uh, but I think many people perhaps think that meditation is difficult and uh, something that they uh, kind of, um, yeah, they think it takes a lot of practice and training and, and they hesitate, hesitate to, to do such, such a woo-woo thing. But uh, as far yeah. as I understand, meditation can be just, I mean, many things. What, what's, the, what's the simplest way of meditation in, in your view? It's a great question. It's a really important one. I think most people do think it's complex and complicated and that you have to have no thoughts in your mind. But that's not the case at all. It is not about not having any thoughts in your mind at all. And anyone that sits there and says to you, oh, yeah, I did this meditation practice. And I, you know, sometimes you hear it, people saying, you know, I, I didn't think of anything I, yeah, I tend to say, yeah, I'm not really buying that. I don't believe that that <laughs> is actually the case. That's, yeah, it's not, it's not really true. Instead, meditation is this. Get your mind into the present moment. Have something that you're focusing on, whether it's your breath or something you're listening to. Your mind will go off, you bring it back. Your mind will go off, you bring it back. Your mind will go off, you bring it back. And the practice is in the bringing back. That's it. Mm. It's a little bit like you lifting, you know, you in bicep curls. You know, when you lift the dumbbell, the muscle's being built. Every time you bring the mind back, you're building a muscle. Through the day, you're going through your day, you never bring your mind back. You let your mind run rampant. You let your mind run all over the place like a blowfly, right? So all you're doing now is bringing it back. So almost like you're bringing it back like a homing pigeon. You're training it to come home, bring the mind home. It goes off, you bring it back. That's meditation. Yeah, It's that simple and it's that difficult, of course, because our minds are so out of control. But if you practice it and you learn, oh, I just have to bring my mind back, that simple, that gentle, then all of a sudden the mind finds that it wants to rest at home more and more and more. And suddenly you're having a conversation. Your mind's not dancing all over the place. You're writing an email. Your mind's not dancing all over the place. You're watching TV. Your mind's not dancing all over the place. You're there. Your stress and anxiety levels begin to lower. So I think the most important thing with, the med with meditation is that you um, find a teacher to teach you, whether it's a online course or someone that you go to, but it has to be someone that's good. There's a lot of people at the moment who have done five minutes of meditation or done a weekend course or are teaching it. They're doing creative visualization or something like that. Make sure you find a good teacher. It's really important. And then learn. I know lots of people who have, you know, I sit every morning for half an hour and I just sit with my mind. That's not meditation. That's ruminating. Okay. <laughs> so it's important so that's, that you don't <laughs> then, yeah, you don't create a habit then of just Oh, I sit with my mind and I let it run off into a million places. That's not going to help you at all because you already do that. Actually, so, I try. I try to sit in what I call the void. So uh, it's not really what you are describing, but 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 I, I recognize <laughs> parts of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just really encourage people to to find a teacher that they like, do a program with them, and le learn the art of meditation. It's you know, I see it as my superpower. It's one of the most powerful things that I've learned. And I I can't speak more highly of it. And try it. Like, you know, in, in the 10-minute mind, we get people to do it for 30 days. It's only 10 minutes a day. Try it for 30 days. See how you go, okay? And at the end of 30 days, if you go, I did it for 10, it's only 10 minutes. I did it for 10 minutes every day for 30 days. There was no change. 
Mm. Fine, let it go. But I've not met one person that's done it for 10 minutes every day for 30 days and not seen a change in themselves. Yes, I, of course, want to ask you now uh, how people, the listeners, the viewers can access your wisdom and your courses and your programs. Uh, where should they go to find to find it and, and how should they go about? And, and what are the most recommended courses and, and programs that, that you can offer? Sure. If you just come to MoniqueRhodes.com, like my name there, Then we have the 10-minute mind you can try for 10 days. The happiness baseline is unbelievable. It's so incredible. We have we test people with the uh, Penn State University happiness inventory at the beginning and at the end. We have a 100% success rate in shifting people's wow. score from the start to the end. Yeah, it's really, really an amazing course. So that's amazing. We have, yeah, l- listen, we've got lots of stuff there. And just come. We have a happiness quiz try it, see where your happiness levels are at. Um, Yeah, we've got lots of stuff for you to, you know, explore there. And also every day I podcast. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have a... There's a a dog who's not meditating. A 10-month-old buddy who's barking away. Um, We have a... uh, My podcast I do every single day. So Yes, every day. That's impressive. I'm just trying to stop him because the last thing I want is I, I didn't expect him to bark and as I promised you that he yes, wouldn't. Yes, said before. <laughs> but he's he's wow. in a little bit of a naughty mood this morning. He's a little black and white Havanese. Yeah, and but it's life. Absolutely it's life. gorgeous. It's yes. just vivid, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Monique Rhodes, it's been a true joy speaking to you today. And I wish you the best of luck with your wonderful endeavor to to spread, you know, the secrets of happiness in the world. Thank you so much, Anders, and for the wonderful work you're doing. And I hope to come and visit you in Stockholm very soon. Please do. Thank you. I will. Bye. If you like this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, Please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. And you can follow Mind the Shift on Facebook and Instagram. And you can follow me, Anders Bolling, on all the main social media and also on medium.com. Thank you.